Friends, in this uh, session, uh, we are going to be dealing with communication. So you're going to need a Bible, so you want to have a Bible uh, close by that you can uh, access and open. I have four uh, headings for you for this uh, session. Uh, We're going to talk about the goals of communication in marriage, the importance of communication in marriage, the heart of communication in marriage, and the application of communication in marriage. And so that's what we are hoping to cover uh, in this session. Uh, I feel like I have an omission to make uh, before uh, we talk about this. I'm not sure why I was asked to speak on communication. If you were to talk with my wife, uh, I've been married for 16 years, my wife's name is Cindy, Uh, she would tell you, I would readily agree, that I have lots of room to grow. Uh, in the area of communication in marriage. It is not one of my strong suits. So uh, as I try to open up God's word with you this morning, I am, I am teaching myself <laughs> as much as I am trying to uh, teach you. Uh, I have learned that uh, good, healthy communication in marriage is very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult, so we do need the Lord's help. And so maybe even as we move through this next hour, just a, a continual prayer God, help me. God, help me. Please help me in my marriage. All right, the goals of communication within marriage. Let me give you three goals here. Uh, One of the goals of marital communication is to build oneness within our marriage. Uh, In other words, marital communication is meant to help cultivate and express our unity and oneness as a husband and wife. Uh, One of the books that I believe you all are uh, receiving uh, by attending this conference is this book called Love That Lasts. And in one of the the chapters in this book where they deal with communication, uh, they they emphasize this oneness and they phrase it this way. They say the goal of our communication is relational intimacy. Let me just read you this opening antidote uh, from one of those chapters. Guys, you can see if you can identify with this. Uh, The author Gary writes, he says, maybe you've experienced something similar. Betsy and I had spent the evening with friends in our home and were cleaning up the kitchen before going to bed. Had you watched us working together, you would have thought we were the model of marital harmony. But then I realized I could still catch the sports on the 10 o'clock news. Sensing a convenient pause in our conversation, I slipped downstairs, rationalizing that most of the work was done anyway. And our conversation, well... When I came back upstairs, the house was clean, everything was put away, and the kitchen was once again spotless, and Betsy was quiet, really quiet. At first I thought, well, she's had a long day, she's probably tired, maybe she doesn't have much to talk about. But as she continued her bedtime preparations in silence, it began to dawn on me, it feels a bit cool in here. (laughs) At times like these, it's easy for husbands to assume or perhaps simply to pretend that all is well. If there's no open conflict, there's no problem, right? How quickly we slide into that passive, selfish, deluded condition that believes no news is good news. How easily we forget that the goal of marriage and the purpose of communication in marriage is so much higher and better than merely getting along. God made husbands and wives for all-encompassing relational intimacy. Uh, And that kind of relational intimacy is expressed and cultivated through communication. You know, think a little bit about what we heard last night with Genesis 1, 2, and 3. uh, And and how God, when he created the the good marriage relationship, and uh, Justin emphasized this, there was was deep intimacy, there there was transparency. But then one of the things that sin did when it came and through their disobedience was to to break that intimacy and to break that that oneness and that that harmony. And so uh, part of the thing that we need to do in our marriage is to to learn to cultivate that and express that. And one of the keys ways we do that is through our communication. When we communicate, we are are opening ourselves up to our spouse. Uh, We are becoming transparent to them. And so that's one of the goals. Communication is meant to build oneness within our marriage. Uh, Another goal of marital communication is spiritual growth. And so when we think about the words that we use with our spouse, we should recognize that we are to use our words to help our spouse grow into Christ-likeness. 
You know, my understanding of the Great Commission is that by definition, a disciple of Jesus is someone who is working to make other disciples of Jesus. And maybe you think that, and maybe you think, okay, I can do that in the church. Maybe I can go out to the mission field and I can do that. But we can also do it within our homes, and we're called to do it within our homes. Uh, we're to help our spouses to, to, to follow Jesus and to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. And the words that we choose to speak can help them in that. And so it's one of the goals of marital communication. A third goal of marital communication is this, edification. Uh, edification is about building others up. Uh, it's about encouragement. It's about strengthening others. And so as we think about what it is that we want to accomplish with our communication in our marriages, one of our goals is to use our words to build up and not to tear down. Okay, so think about the way that you go about communicating in your marriage. And maybe even think just about this past week. Uh, with the words that you spoke to your spouse this past week, what were you trying to accomplish? Uh, were you seeking to build unity and oneness and relational intimacy within your marriage? Uh, were you seeking to help your spouse grow spiritually as a disciple of Jesus? And were you seeking the overall well-being of your spouse, seeking to build him or her up with your words? Or perhaps you're not even sure what you were trying to accomplish. <laughs> perhaps you were just speaking words without thinking much about it. Well, again, this, this is what we're after with our communication. Oneness, spiritual growth, and edification. And listen, I, I think those are, are wonderful goals, don't you? I mean, I think those are, those are some big, grand goals. And think if they were being accomplished in your marriage, if there was a kind of relational intimacy and oneness. Uh, if you were really being used by God as a tool to help your spouse grow into Christ-likeness. If you were really someone who's helping to build up your spouse. These are great goals. And so we want to think well about communication, see what God's Word has to say. So our second heading this morning is this, the importance of communication within marriage. Now, I mean, hopefully you can begin to see just how important it is uh, based on these goals, but in order for us to see just how important our words are to achieving these goals, let's, let's think about what the Bible emphasizes about the power of the words we speak. And just to put it very simply, according to the Bible, our words are very, very, very important. For one, just consider the big picture reality that all of our communication belongs to the Lord. Remember, it was emphasized last night, not only is everything from God, but it's all for God. <laughs> it's all for His glory. All of our communication, it belongs to the Lord. One of the greatest truths about God is that he speaks. Or we shouldn't take that for granted. God speaks. He spoke the world into existence. And he's given us his word, his written word, the Bible. And we are made in God's image. And we talk, we speak. And as such, we are to steward our words for the glory of God. Uh, our communication is a reflection of who he is, and it's for his glory. So we want all of our words to glorify God. Now, you may think, yeah, but I speak a lot of words throughout the course of the day. <laughs> uh, my words are just coming out of my mouth. Uh, I, yeah, studies show that, uh, depending on the person, uh, somewhere between seven and 20,000 words is what each person speaks every day. You think, how can I steward all of those words for the glory of God? Well, that's what we're after. Uh, we want all of our lives, all of our words to, to bring God glory. So open up your Bibles. Look with me at Matthew 12, verse 36. Uh, we're going to look at some of the verses before it uh, in just a moment. But right now, I just want to look at verse 36. So Matthew 12, verse 36. This is Jesus teaching. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every 
careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now be clear, Jesus uh, isn't saying that, that, that your words will save you, uh, but rather that your words will give a testimony as to whether or not you are saved. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, Jesus' point here is that our words are a reflection of what's really in our hearts. But, uh, but just think about the scope of what Jesus is saying there in verse 36. Right? We will give an account for every careless word we speak. Uh, the word careless has this idea uh, of words that are fruitless, uh, they don't they only really achieve anything good. They're, they're, they're selfish words. They're dishonoring words. They're, they're words that tear down. And, and the reason Jesus puts such significance on our words is because ultimately words can bring life or death. Proverbs 18.21, is, I think is a key proverb here. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so that proverb is, is basically saying that there, there really are no neutral words. <laughs> words have the power to bring life or death. Uh, similarly, look uh, at James chapter 3. Well, this well-known description of the tongue, beginning verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So that's a description of what careless words can do. Right? They're, they're, they're powerful. They can bring destruction. And perhaps you've experienced that in your life. Uh, perhaps you've been on the receiving end of destructive words. Perhaps you've been the one who has spoken destructive words. And, and no doubt, you also know what it is to, to have heard and spoken words of life. My words are powerful. They can bring life or death. Uh, words of life are those that bring encouragement, love, peace, instruction, healing. Uh, words of death are those that feed anger, malice, jealousy, slander, violence, revenge, condemnation, lying, ungratefulness. And so you can probably think of in your own marriage the effects that poor communication has had upon your marriage as well as some of the effects that good communication has had upon your marriage. If I want you to do that now, what's, think about what's one good ef effect that communication has had on your marriage, good communication. What's, what's one positive way that your marriage has been impacted by good communication? Just, just quietly try to think of something And conversely, think, what's, what's, one, what's one effect that poor communication has had upon your marriage? Now, here are some of the common effects that poor communication can have upon a marriage. God isn't honored. Uh, the relationship is strained. Uh, discord and conflict become common. Issues in the marriage remain unclear. Uh, wrong ideas go uncorrected. Bitterness sets in. 
Wise decisions are thwarted. Ultimately, maybe there's a temptation to communicate with someone outside the marriage relationship. Uh, here are some common effects that good communication, though, can have upon a marriage. God is honored. The relationship is strengthened. Companionship and oneness are enjoyed even more. Harmony is present. Disagreements can be handled more quickly. Problem issues can be clarified and resolved. Wrong ideas are corrected. Forgiveness and trust come easier. Good decision-making is enhanced. Okay, so words are very, very important. Uh, All our communication belongs to the Lord who himself speaks and we're made in his image. Uh, We will give an account for every careless word we speak. And because our words are powerful, they can bring life or death. So let's give some thought to uh, our third heading, which is the heart of communication in marriage. And as we come to the issue of the heart, uh, let me ask you to do a little bit of an exercise. Okay, let's, let's imagine that uh, this horrible thing happens, and all of the words that you have spoken over the last month have somehow been secretly recorded. And we have the tape. <laughs> We're about to roll the tape. Roll it, brother. <laughs> that would be horrible, right? I mean, am I the only one who thinks that that would be horrible? But let's pretend like it's about to happen. Everybody in here is about to hear the words that you have spoken over the last month. If we were to hear that, what would we learn about you? Uh, what would your words, your communication reveal about who you are? Uh, What would it reveal about what it is that you love, for instance? Uh, What would your words and communication reveal about what it is that you're living for in your life? You see, the, the truth is that our communication, our words, they reveal a great deal about us. So let's look again at that section in Matthew 12. Now, we already looked at verse 36, but let's go now and look at the verses before it. In verses 33 and 35. Okay, so Matthew 12, beginning there at verse 33. This is, again, this is Jesus teaching. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, speaking to the Pharisees. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned." For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So clearly Jesus here is making a connection between our heart and our communication. So what is our heart? Well, as you no doubt know, when the Bible uh, speaks of our hearts, the focus really isn't just on our affections and uh, what it is that we're feeling or desiring. Rather, in the Bible, the heart is uh, it's everything immaterial about you. It's your, it's your inner man. In fact, we might say that it's really the control center of your life. Uh, in the sense that it's, it's where all of our thinking and, and all of our wants and all of our desires, all, it's where all of those things originate. So the heart is the source of all of those things in our life. Think of Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Why? For from it flow the springs of life. Okay, so it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Uh, The good heart that's stored up good things, speaking words of life and goodness. The evil heart that's stored up evil things, speaking words of death and evil. Uh, Paul Tripp, 
in his marriage seminar, uh, what did you expect? He, he gives an illustration of this. Uh, he tells of the time when he and his uh, younger brother were, were kids and they were uh, at a family holiday gathering. And, and later in the evening, he, he, him and his brother, they were down in the basement with his uncle and some others. And his uncle, uh, having consumed some alcohol, is, is speaking with profanity and obscenities. And, and Paul tells a story of his mother uh, grabbing him and his brother and running out of the house with them. And he says, he, he, she grabbed us so fast that our feet never touched the doorstep as we were flying out of the house. She was getting us out of there so quickly. But on the ride home, his mother said, it wasn't the alcohol that caused those words to come out of your uncle's mouth. The alcohol just loosened his lips. The words, she said, were already there. They were there in his heart. All right, so think about it. The next time that you're speaking words that are hurtful or harmful to your spouse, uh, Jesus is saying that, that those are there already in you. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't just sort of all of a sudden come out of nowhere. Uh, no, these things sadly flow out of our hearts. And thus, you see, they reveal things about us that we'd, we'd, we'd probably rather not think about most of the time. Uh, they reveal that we've stored up words and thoughts and ideas and attitudes in our heart that we shouldn't have stored up. And again, verse 35, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. And so all of us uh, have some work to do here. <laughs> Uh, we all, to some degree, have stored up some evil treasure uh, that we shouldn't have stored up, and it's negatively affecting our ability to accomplish the communication goals that we want for our marriage. And so again, we, we all have some work that we need to do, because if we want to improve the communication in our marriage and accomplish those great and wonderful goals, then we need to address our heart. So how do we do that? Uh, if our heart is the control center of our communication, how do we go about changing it? Uh, how do we go about storing up good treasure in our hearts? Well, fundamentally, it's only God uh, who can change our hearts. And so we must rely on him and, and the power of his grace to transform us. That, that prayer of David uh, should, should readily be on our lips. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Create in me a clean heart. And yet, at the same time, God has also given us, as his people, uh, tools that we can employ. Uh, for one, we should be nourishing our hearts in the truth of God's word. I mean, that, that's fundamental. Uh, we all need the nourishment that reading and meditating on and studying and memorizing God's word brings. Because if we store up the treasure of God's word in our hearts, then out of that treasure will come life-giving words from our lips. And so if you really want to improve in your, your marital communication, then make sure that you have a consistent time in God's word. Uh, God has also given us the gift of prayer and fellowship with him by which our, our hearts can be nourished. And so uh, we want to be in constant communication with God, focusing our attention on, on God and his kingdom, asking him for help, uh, being honest with him about what's going on in our lives. Uh, if we have stored up evil treasure, being honest about that with God, confessing that to him, repenting of that. Uh, we, of course, also have the gift of the Holy Spirit at work within us to help us and guide us and strengthen us. And so then relying on the Holy Spirit, we want to do what Proverbs 4.23 tells us to do, to keep our hearts with all vigilance. Uh, Tripp, in that same series I mentioned, he says, when I sin against my wife, what I'm doing is dehumanizing her. I'm turning her into an object to get what I want, or I see her as an obstacle getting in the way of what I want. And friends, that's what, that's what our hearts, when in sin, do. It's, it, it's all about us. And, and we use our words to manipulate our spouse to make it all about us. And so we have to continually war against the, the selfish, false idols that are in our heart. 
Uh, we have to learn to identify those idolatrous desires that manifest themselves in our words and actions. Again, if there was a tape in here playing everything that you had just spoken over the last month, it's going to reveal a lot about who you really are and what you love and what you value. And so we have to learn to, to, to be vigilant in keeping our hearts and to fight against those selfish desires. Uh, there's lots more we could say about that particular aspect, but uh, here's what we need to remember about our heart in communication. Okay, one, our words and communication reveal what we're wanting and desiring. Two, our words and communication are never out of nowhere. In one sense, there are no accidental words. Uh, it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Three, because our words are manufactured and produced in our heart, then whatever rules our heart will rule our words and communication. And therefore, four, if you want real change to take place with how you communicate in your marriage, you need to start with the heart. You're going to need to be vigilant about cultivating a heart that's set on God and his kingdom. And is it, is it King Jesus who's really ruling my heart today? Okay, so let's pause here for just a moment and let's think about what we've just been saying. Uh, if the goals of marital communication are really as great and wonderful uh, as we've laid them out to be, oneness, spiritual growth, and edification, and if our words and communication are really so important that they can actually bring life or death, and if the heart of our marital communication is the heart itself, th then listen, what, what all of that means, right, before we go any further, is that what you and I need most is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need our heart to be shaped by the truth and experience of the gospel so that the words that flow from it bring life and not death. Uh, our brother Keith this morning so uh, helpfully articulated what the biblical gospel is. Uh, God has created us. and It's good, but we sinned against him. Uh, we've turned our backs on him, and God would be perfectly just to let us die in our sin, but he hasn't done that. In his mercy, he has sent his son, who is God himself, to come and live the life that we should have lived, and yet he died the death that we deserve, dying in our place for our sin, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made right with God and spend eternity with him. And he did it for anyone, anyone, ever, who would ever turn from their sin and put their trust in him. Praise God that there is forgiveness for every careless word we speak. Amen. There is forgiveness for every careless word that you and I speak. And so we, we need the gospel. We need the forgiveness that comes from the gospel. And we need to have our hearts ongoingly shaped by the gospel. Because here's what a gospel heart shape looks like. Okay, a gospel-shaped heart that speaks life-giving words which lead to oneness and spiritual growth and edification in a marriage is a heart that's humble. Because what exactly do we have to boast about? It's a heart that's other-oriented. Like Jesus, it seeks to serve others, and so it operates by the principles of, of absolute love, absolute unselfishness, absolute humility. Uh, it's a heart that's hopeful, because we know that our eternity is secure in Christ. So it's not cynical, it's, it's not bitter, it's hopeful. It's a heart that's honest because it has nothing to hide. God already knows everything about us and yet he's chosen to love us anyway. Uh, it's a heart that's pure and growing in purity. And it's a heart that, that beats with an all-consuming love for God. Uh, that's what a heart that's shaped by the gospel begins to look like. Because ultimately it's a, it's a new heart. And that's what God gives us. He gives us new hearts out of which new communication patterns can flow. So if you've never put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that, that's the very first thing you need to do. This is where you start. Turn away from your sin and grab hold of Jesus by faith with all that you are. And then once we've taken that fundamental and decisive step of faith towards Jesus, then as we, as we go to the Word of God, what we find there in the Bible is a whole lot of wisdom for us as we go about seeking to grow in our marital communication. 
And that brings us to the final heading for this session, and that's the application of communication in marriage. Uh, I want to look primarily with you at, at Ephesians chapter 4. So if you would, turn to Ephesians 4 as we think about the application of communication. We've been kind of dipping in and out of uh, Ephesians already uh, last night and this morning, but let me just uh, set the context for you briefly to remind you uh, where Ephesians 4 comes within this letter. Uh, Ephesians 1 to 3 is really a lot of uh, deep, wonderful theology, unpacking what God has done in eternity past to save individual sinners and then to, to bring them into a community, a, a church, whereby in their relationships they get to show off the power of the gospel and how the gospel transforms people's lives. And then chapters 4 to 6 are largely focused on application. And so no doubt, as, you, as you've heard many times before, what you have first are the indicatives, and only then do you have the imperatives. Okay, so the indicatives state the, the facts uh, of what is, and the imperatives tell us what then we should do in light of those facts. And so as you think about the way that applies to Ephesians, the entire context of Ephesians is organized around the principle of instructing people to become who they really are in Christ. So who are we in Christ? Well, if you have a Bible open, actually go back to Ephesians 1 and look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. Okay, so who are we in Christ? Well, part of the answer there from Ephesians 1 is that we are children of God. Uh, in and through Jesus, we've been adopted into God's family. And this is, a, this is a family of love. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. Uh, that's who we are. And so as we come to chapter 4, the imperatives of chapter 4 are built on the indicatives of chapter 1. And we're therefore called to live and act and talk as those who are children of God in Christ, because that's who we really are. Now, if you look at the specifics of chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 16 are all about unity in the body of Christ. And here, the emphasis is on the church. It's, it's, it's unity within the church. And then in verses 17 to 23, Paul uh, once again reminds uh, them of the indicatives that are true of them, as he points them back to the new life that they've received in Christ, and thus the implications that that has for their present life. So if you look at verse 17, Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and it is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so he reminds them of, of who they were. He reminds them of the way that they used to walk, and then he reminds them of who they now are. And, and then out of that, he calls them to be who they really are. Uh, put off your old self. You're not that old person anymore. And put on your new self, who you really are in Christ. And then in verses 25 to 32, Paul starts to get very specific. And, and the first aspect of the new self that he addresses has to do with the way we communicate. Uh, there are ways of communicating that we need to put off, and there are ways of communicating that we need to put on. Okay, so let's read through these verses, and then we'll, we'll walk through them more slowly. Uh, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And then chapter 5, verse 1, again, be who you are. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Uh, I think we can identify four principles here for communication. The first is this. Uh, be honest. Uh, when it comes to communication, when it comes to you speaking words to your spouse, be honest. That's verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now, there's both a, a put-off and a put-on aspect uh, to that. We're to uh, put off or put away falsehood. So th- there should be no deceit of any kind within marriage. Uh, no lies. No keeping secrets, uh, no saying one thing but really meaning another, uh, no exaggerating. Uh, we, want, we want to completely put off falsehood. It's part of our old identity. And remember that one of uh, our goals with marital communication is oneness. Okay, but think about how lying eats away at the unity in a marriage. Uh, that's why the Bible emphasizes here in this context that we're members of one another. Now, Paul, Paul's emphasized now with the church there, but I mean, if that's true of the church, of course it's true of a husband and wife who are one flesh. We're, we're members of one another. And lying, deceit, dishonesty just tears apart the unity within a marriage. And so they conversely, uh, what we should put on is honesty and truth-telling. Uh, God is truth, and those made in God's image, we want to speak the truth. So consider... As you think about your communication with your marriage, how, how would you rate, this is, this is for yourself, how would you rate your level of honesty with your spouse? One being not very honest, ten being very honest. Just be honest with yourself. How would you rate your level of honesty with your spouse? Uh, as you consider that, let's try to think a little bit deeper about honesty and dishonesty within marriage, because this, this is really fundamental, again, to the oneness and the unity of marriage. And dishonesty can sneak in in so many subtle ways. Uh, Winston Smith, who's written a, a helpful book on marriage called Marriage Matters, he identifies some of the uh, different ways that dishonesty might surface in our communication in marriage. Uh, he says, <clears throat> with the exception of outright lies, much of the dishonesty that cripples communication is subtle of a kind that you might not even recognize as dishonesty. And then he gives three examples. Uh, There's what he calls the double bind. The double bind. Uh, That's where one spouse is put in a situation where it's a uh, a lose-lose situation for them. Okay, so maybe one spouse is saying something with their words, but with their body language, they're communicating something very different. And so it leaves the other spouse unable to engage in any constructive way. For example, think of the person who who screams, I'm not angry! (laughs) Her face is turning red. (laughs) Veins are popping out. I'm not angry! What is the other person supposed to do in that moment? Do you you take the words seriously, or do you take the the body and the the, the tone of, of what they're saying seriously? And the person who claims not to be angry, but clearly is, isn't communicating honestly. And so Smith says, when you do that, you're putting your spouse in a double bind. Double bind messages conceal the truth and make difficult situations worse. Okay, we're to put off falsehood. Uh, Another example of a a more subtle form of dishonesty is that of indirection. Uh, Smith says that this is where we uh, sometimes try to soften the truth by communicating indirectly or dropping hints. 
Uh, We make comments that, if properly understood, might offend our spouse, so we hide the message in an offhand comment or behavior. It gives us wiggle room to deny that the offensive message was the one we intended. Uh, So it's not being honest about what we're really after. Um, I, I, uh, I sometimes will send my wife a picture of something that's like a total disaster, like something went wrong during the day, and maybe I think it's her fault. <laughs> so I take a picture of the, the, the aftermath. I, I did this this past week as I was preparing, I realized that this is really, this is, this is dishonest. Uh, after I sent it, I realized this. Because uh, what I did, I sent the picture with no words. So, it, but it was my way of saying to her, my whole day is totally a disaster now. It's messed up, everything I had planned, and, and this is your fault, right? Can we do this better? It was, it's wrong in so many ways. But I didn't put any words to it. So, like, she, she can come back and say, why, you're, you're sending me this message. I can say, no, I'm not. I'm just showing you, I'm just sending you a picture, a picture of the evidence. You know, it's, it's indirect. It's, it's dishonest. It's not being honest about what we're really after or what's really going on. Okay, so the double bind, indirection, and then a third form of subtle dishonesty is misdirection. Misdirection. Says Smith, uh, sometimes the truth is too hot to handle. We can't contain our anger and frustration over something, yet we're afraid to tackle the real issue. So rather than talk about the real problem, we manufacture another. You never put the toothpaste away. Ever. You always leave the toothpaste on the counter. Okay. (laughs) Is this really about the toothpaste? Or is this about something else that the person is not addressing? So it's a form of misdirection. I, I give you those. Just again, we want to we try to recognize some of the subtle ways that dishonesty might creep in and, and corrode the unity within our marriage. So we want to be who we are in Christ. We want to put away fa- falsehood in all its forms. We want to put on honesty because without it we will not have unity in our marriage. Communication principle number two uh, from Ephesians 4. Keep current. Keep current. Uh, I get this from verses 26 and 27. Uh, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, One way to understand that uh, is to think of the old piece of wisdom to solve today's problems today. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And it's interesting that Paul brings in anger here and stresses the need to deal with it because anger just, it inhibits our ability to communicate well, and it destroys relationships, including marriages. And in fact, the indication from these verses is that anger is the devil's work. Right? Why must we deal with, with anger when it arises? Well, because we, we, we don't want to give any opportunity to the devil to be at work in our marriage. And interestingly, I think James in James chapter 4 makes the same point. Right? He asks that question, what, what causes quarrels, what causes fights among you? Is it not because you have the, these passions that are, that are at war within you? And then a few verses later, he gives this, this little instruction, resist the devil. Uh, the Christian author Ed Welch says that when we give in to our anger, it's like inviting the devil to come in and do his destructive work in our marriage. And that's why Paul here is saying, don't let anger build up within you and fester, because if you don't communicate and deal with it, it's like inviting the devil into your marriage. So maybe just think, maybe think of that the next time you're in that moment, you have that split-second decision, are you going to exhibit self-control or are you going to explode in anger? Going the route of anger is like giving an open invitation to the devil to come into your marriage and wreak havoc. And think about how our our anger is so often expressed through words. There are so many angry words out there. And so we're to put off anger. And we're to put on a type of communication that addresses the the problems of the day. Okay, so that means no silent treatment. Uh, That means no pretending like nothing happened. When all the while you're you're just burning up inside. Uh, my wife would tell you that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a burner on the inside. It's a, it's a slow burn. It just eats away. 
But that's not what we're instructed to do here. Again, the idea here is that we're to deal with those problems as soon as we can. And that doesn't necessarily, uh, I think, have to mean that very night. Maybe you come to an agreed conclusion at midnight. It's late. We're not going to make any headway here. We're tired. Let's agree together to wait until the morning to talk about this and work through it. The idea here is just not to let it fester too long. Okay, so let me uh, briefly just give you some quick thoughts on how we might bring up and talk through some difficult anger-inducing issues that often arise in marriage relationships. We're going to probably do some of this within the conflict session later. But here, here are six questions to ask yourself before bringing up a difficult problem with your spouse. Okay? One, have I examined myself? Okay, think log and spec here. Have I got that log out of my eye before I address the spec in my spouse's eye? Have I examined myself? Two, do I have the facts correct? Proverbs 18, 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Do I have the facts correct? Three, is what I'm addressing sin? And if so, what kind of sin? Uh, 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, maybe this is something that doesn't need to be addressed. Maybe this is an offense that I can, I can absorb and let it go. Four, is my timing right? Proverbs 15, 23, a word in season, how good it is. Five, is my attitude right? Why am I bringing this up? Uh, am I seeking the spiritual growth of my spouse? Am I seeking God's glory here? Or am, I, am I just doing this for my own benefit? Six, are my words loving? Yes, truth matters. But as Paul says earlier in this chapter, verse 15, we should speak the truth in love. Now, someone has described the act of speaking truth without love as being like a doctor who performs surgery without applying an anesthetic. <laughs> that kind of truth-telling isn't going to strengthen our marriages. Seven, have I prayed for God's help? Remember, the devil's at work here. This is a spiritual battle. Okay, have I prayed for God's help? So that's the second communication principle here. Uh, keep current. Third principle, uh, be a servant in your communication. Be a servant in your communication. Look at verses 28 to 30. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I think perhaps one of the implications of these verses is that not all honesty is of the same value. Do you know what I mean by that? Does that make sense? Not all honesty is of the same value. There may be moments in our marriage uh, where we are very honest with our spouse. Brutally honest, as my dad used to say. That guy is brutally honest. We're very honest with our spouse, such that the words that are coming out of our mouth are true words, but, but they're destructive rather than constructive. And so it's speaking truth, but it's not speaking the truth in love. You know, so, so maybe you come home after a long day, you're hungry, you've been working, and your spouse has very lovingly made you this meal. And you bite into it, and you say, that is terrible. I've done that before in terms of making the food. It was really bad, and my wife is much more generous than that. That is terrible, you say. Maybe it is. Maybe it's like the worst meal ever. But is that really achieving any of those goals that we talked about at the beginning? No, of course not. So we want to remember those goals. We want to communicate in such a way that we're cultivating oneness in our marriage and in such a way that we're helping our spouse to grow spiritually. So, yes, we always want to be honest in our communication, but what verses 28 to 30 clarifies is that we also want a constructive honesty. Uh, we want to communicate in such a way that we're helping both ourselves and our spouse along the path of maturity in Christ. Uh, that's why I say that one of the principles of communication here is that we're to be servants to each other, helping each other, building each other up. And so the truth and honesty that we want in our marriage is, is to be guided by that kind of love and servanthood and, and not that which is simply the result of venting or clearing the air. All right, sometimes we, we vent all of our frustrations and we clear the air in the name of being honest. 
But in fact, the Bible calls it foolishness to speak whatever is on your mind without first reflecting on it, whether it's true or not. Proverbs 12, 23, a prudent man keeps his knowledge to himself, but the heart of fools blurts out folly. So we, again, we need to remember that words are powerful. They can bring life or death. And so, so we need wisdom in all of this. We need wisdom to know the difference between what we think or feel and, and what we should share. And, and if you think about it, that, that of course means that we need to know our spouse well enough to decide what we should share and how and when to share it. Uh, that's the kind of constructive honesty that the Bible is describing here in Ephesians 4. So what exactly are we to put off and, and put on here in these verses? Well, I think it's interesting that verse 28 is mixed in here with a section that largely has to do with communication. Uh, but perhaps verse 28 serves as sort of a, a model of what we're trying to accomplish with our words. Right? Verse 28 is about the thief. Okay, so a thief is to put off what? Stealing. Right? In other words, he's to stop causing harm to others with his actions and, and robbing others of their re- resources and goods by which they can thrive in this world. And instead, he's to put on what? Labor. But not just labor for the sake of labor, but labor so that he can serve others, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Well, in verse 29, that's essentially what we're, what we're to do with our words. That we're to put off words that tear down and bring destruction, words that cause harm to our spouse and that inhibit our spouse from really thriving. We're to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths. That would include all words of insult. Dumb, stupid, crazy, idiot. Or you're a liar. Or you're such a jerk. Friends, if you use that kind of corrupting name calling, uh, what you're essentially doing is reducing your spouse's identity to their sinful behavior. And as a result, you're tearing them down spiritually instead of doing anything that's really constructive in their lives. I mean, it's it's revealing that Jesus was quite strident about the destruction that name-calling can bring. Jesus said in Matthew 5, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Uh, The corrupting words we should put off would also include similar things like exaggerating, You always do this. You never do that. Again, that's that's usually just destructive. It's another way of reducing your spouse's identity to nothing more than their sin. So we should put off all corrupting, unwholesome, destructive talk. Those kinds of words should never come out of our mouth. And then instead, we should put on, as verse 29 tells us, that which is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And when we do that, verse 30 is telling us that we'll then be keeping in step with God's Holy Spirit, whom he's placed within us, uh, those of us who are his children. And so we want always to speak words that edify. And you can, you can try to think of this image of, of what it's like to, to really build up your spouse with your words. You're building them up. You're strengthening them. Uh, as fits the occasion means that it's uh, not only the right words, but it's the right time. So you're speaking words that meet the needs of your spouse in that moment. Uh, so again, good communication requires really knowing your spouse well. So you, you have to continually be growing uh, as a student of your spouse. I like to think of my, myself as a student of my wife, uh, constantly learning about her and, and, and growing in my knowledge of her so I can speak the right words to her at the right time to build her up. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve then having the best interests of our spouse in mind. It's going to re- require humility. Again, it is a form of communication that really is a form of servanthood. Uh, to communicate this way is to be a servant to your spouse. So in your communication, be a servant. And then uh, the fourth principle of communication that we see here in Ephesians 4 is act, don't react. Act, don't react. So as beloved children of God in Christ, we want to put off communication that's reactive in nature. And verse 31 is filled with all sorts of examples of reactive communication. Uh, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So we want to to put off uh, bitterness your, your spouse does something uh, that, that's hurtful to you. 
and your reactive response is to become bitter and resentful. Uh, we want to learn to put off that kind of reaction. We also want to put off wrath, uh, which are these outbursts of rage. We want to put off anger. Uh, this is the kind of internal smoldering or hostility that we allow to burn within us. Uh, we want to put off clamor, uh, which is a harsh kind of argumentation or, or, or public quarreling. Uh, we want to put off slander, so defaming our spouse, speaking negatively of him or her to others. Uh, we want to put off malice, which is a, a desire to really harm our spouse. Right, you see, all these things in our sin, th- these can be very natural ways of, of responding. And so we need, to, we need to work in the power of God's grace and spirit to, to put them off, to, to not respond in that way that feels so natural in our sin. And then in their place, we want to put on a type of communication that's more proactive and initiating in nature, uh, that, that doesn't respond in a like manner to maybe the harsh way that we're being spoken to, but that which instead acts to change the tone of the conversation. And so as God's beloved children in Christ, verse 32 Uh, We want to put on kindness, and we want our words to come out of a heart that's tender and compassionate, Uh, and thus we want to strive to be those who speak words of forgiveness to one another. And why? Well, because this is how God has treated us in Christ. Uh, We were his enemies. We treated him shamefully. Uh, We were full of bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice towards God, and yet in Christ, he didn't merely react to us to give us what we deserved, but instead he acted toward us with kindness and tenderheartedness and forgave forgave us of our sin against him. And so we too now, as God's children, we want to do the same with our spouse. Uh, We don't want to merely react to maybe the poor way that we're being treated, but to take the initiative and act in a Christ-like way. Okay, so so four principles for communication here. Be honest, keep current, be a servant, and act, don't react. And so friends, all day long, uh, when it comes to our communication with our spouse, it's 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 a constant putting off and putting on. Right, putting off the old self and putting on that new self, living into that new identity that we have in Christ as God's beloved children. So friends, remember who you are in Christ. Uh, remember the gospel. You're forgiven, you're set free. And not only that, but you have a new heart. Uh, you are not the same person you once were. You are God's beloved child. So, so live like it and talk like it. So just as a final word of application and, and encouragement, uh, one idea is maybe just to uh, consider taking those three goals that we mentioned at the beginning and, and writing them down somewhere, right? And, and come back to them occasionally. Again, our goals are to, to cultivate and express oneness or unity within our marriage. Uh, it's to help my spouse grow spiritually into the image of Jesus, and it's to, to be a general source of edification to my spouse. Maybe write those down somewhere. Come back to them in a month's time and kind of just do some self-examination and assessment. How, how have I been u- using my words over the last month? To, to accomplish these goals within my marriage. And maybe this is something you, you and your spouse could do together. Talk through it together in a loving and constructive way and help each other to grow in this area. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we thank you that you speak truth and that you are good. And Lord, we thank you for your grace to us that you have adopted us into your family. Uh, Lord, we, we long to look like you, to image you, to bring you glory uh, in the way that we speak. And so, Lord, would you help us with this? Would you help us to take these things here uh, today from your word and not just hear them, but to to apply them to our lives, Lord? Uh, You know the various struggles in our marriage. You know the various failings that we have. Lord, would you help us to grow, that our marriages would thrive, they would bring you honor, and that we would bring you honor. Lord, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your love, and thank you for your forgiveness in Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Keith. Let's thank Keith for opening up the word to us. Thank you, brother.